Wherefore, part 32. Badger Boy has discovered that the shifts do not all happen at exactly the same time. Everyone has their own relationship with the full moon. This means that sometimes he will shift before Elizabeth or she will revert to human form before he goes back to being a badger. At the last full moon they had a little time when both of them were human. For those precious breaths they stood together naked in the early light, holding each other tightly. There are a great many things he wants to express to her, but the holding tightly seems like the best way, even if it isn't so good for dealing with details. It all makes him wonder what this time in a human body is for. Even though he has rejected meaning, Badger Boy cannot help but suspect there is purpose in all of this. Why him? Is it fate? Does he believe in fate? Does he believe in free will? He did not become a shapeshifter of his own free will, certainly, which begs the question of whether some will, other than his own, has been involved. Sitting in Elizabeth's garden, he picks up peanut fragments from under the bird feeder and waits for her to emerge. Tonight he is in his everyday badger self and she will come outside in her human skin and they will sit together. Communication is limited, but he values this time. It does have meaning, he reflects. Life might be ultimately meaningless, but sitting with Elizabeth is rich with significance. She always comes out at dusk to look for him. It matters to them both. She arrives. He nuzzles her ankle. She offers him peanuts and lays out a blanket. They sit together, bodies warm where they meet. The naked, furless skin of her arm lying across the thick roughness of his fur. When they are both human, he is slightly larger than her. As a badger, he is much the smaller of the two of them. When she is a rhubarb, it is different again, and they don't touch at that point. She cannot move, and he worries what will happen if he breaks her stems. Their relationship is complicated, to say the least. But at the same time, something about it is remarkably easy. The love that exists in sharing space, in being two mammals together, is uncomplicated. He wishes they could talk about size and shape, the shape of her other self. The size of the giants whose barely present forms he sometimes sees at night. These rare times when their sizes and shapes are similar. Why is love easiest when sizes and shapes align? He has talked about this with Wigston at great length, but is not much the wiser for it. But then Wigston favours love on the grand scale, hills, giants, that sort of thing. Did you know there is a man inside the hill who is in love with Oolites? Wigston asked him last time they talked. Badger Boy did not know this. It's the scales. One Oolite is so tiny compared to a human. The Oolites together are so vast on the human scale. A human lifespan is equally so tiny. The eternity of Oolites is almost unthinkable. Badger Boy supposes that on this scale the differences between himself and Elizabeth are hardly important at all. Love at different scales is difficult. There is a giant who is taken to sitting on the hillside at dusk for the express purpose of watching Badger Boy and Elizabeth. It is both an innocent watching and an amorous one. Innocent because being an ethereal giant of indeterminate gender does not create much scope for experiencing human ideas of shame. The giant adores, and so the giant watches the strange dance of love and tenderness played out between two mismatched creatures in a small garden. Love leaps the divide between impossibly different beings. While the giant tries to make sense of itself, this gentle evening ritual of touch and companionship becomes its way marker, its touchstone. This is what matters most, the giant has decided. This is the point of everything. And so by night the giant learns from observation and comes to an understanding about what love means and why it matters. The giant opens its enormous and insubstantial heart to these two small beings and their curious mutual attachment. Even as Badger Boy contemplates the challenge of size difference, this entity, so enormous as to go unnoticed, is learning from Badger Boy that love transcends scale, that you can fall in love with anything, be willingly overwhelmed and no longer know who you are as a consequence, and that that is the most wonderful adventure imaginable. The giant dreams, and in its dreaming becomes a little more real. 
Wigston's night wanderings now revolve around the place where the giant likes to sit. Why the giant sits there at night and what holds it in such rapt attention, he does not know. As he would never expect the giant to turn its attention his way, he experiences no jealousy in seeing the focus with which it gazes down into the town. He has never knowingly been the focus of that sort of attention. Wigston's romantic leanings incline him towards being so large that they generally have no notion he even exists. He loves on a scale that makes lack of reciprocity almost welcome. How could a hill possibly love him in return? It would make no sense. As Wigston goes about his nightly lovelorn rounds, he too is watched. Sometimes from so close by that surely he must feel the breath of the watcher on the back of his neck. And yet he does not. Sometimes the watching is distanced, appearing through the smallest of cracks between here and there. This watcher also does not quite know why they feel so compelled to gaze. This watcher knows playfulness and obsession, devouring and desire, but not love. Not yet. They trade in ideas of love, they seduce and enchant, but have never fallen themselves, and do not know what it means to fall. Do not recognise the danger signs in all of this craving and watching and feeling the need to come back for one more glance. Just one more taste of the air downwind as the wizard Wigstan passes by. This watcher does not succumb. They are not charmed. They most certainly do not fall in love. These are truths about themselves that they have never questioned. Just a few more minutes then to watch him circumnavigate the hill, to listen to his conversation with a bat and to the sentiments he expresses to the oblivious figure of the sitting giant. It is in the nature of the spirit of the were-rhubarb to cause others to fall in love, to be loved, but not to love, not yet. They watch and follow and somehow night after night just accidentally happen to be wherever Wigston is. Fewer temptation plants are unleashed into the world. For the first time in a long time, this wild spirit pauses to ask why it does what it does and whether it wants to keep doing what it does and what else might be possible. A force of something a lot like nature, the were rhubarb, is not in the habit of second-guessing itself. And yet, and yet, now they cannot resist the faint smell of peanut wood smoke and earth that indicates Wigston's passing. They cannot focus on making more people into plants. Nothing makes proper sense to them. Somewhere in a quiet corner of Stroud, the weaver sits in contemplation of the weave. There are so many threads now that run in defiance of old patterns, so many choices being made. The weaver feels for the trickster magic of the were rhubarb and watches that fairy spirit watching Wigston, traces threads of longing across the valleys. It is in the nature of the weaver to meddle, to intensify. Love a little more. Question yourself. Go deeper. Think harder about what you do and why. Surrender a little. The weaver tugs upon the threads of reality because there needs to be more magic in the world and more substance to the magic and more strength in the weave of existence. The reason weaver magic is so difficult, so unappealing to most wizards, is that to do it you have to know what the most fundamental forces in the universe are and be willing to take them between your fingers and pull. Where wizards invariably come undone with this is that they assume they need to carefully understand the nature of the fundamental forces in order to work with them. What makes a person a weaver is an innate understanding that when you tangle with the weave you are deciding what the most fundamental forces are and acting accordingly, and that this will change everything. The weaver has only ever really wanted one thing, but the moon is often away doing moon things, and there is really nothing and no one the weaver would give that power to anyway. And so the weaver sits and works the threads because love is the most important and powerful force in the universe and does not notice that the pattern of her own threads is changing, and does not notice the person in the story who is further ahead and can see exactly what is coming. The weaver knows a lot at this point, but the narrator has the advantage of hindsight.